Um, so our scripture reading is found in Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And in the church um, Bible, it's page 1049. Um, and it reads, And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Good morning, everyone. I finally made it. Do you know that I was supposed to be here a number of years ago? I don't know if you're aware of that. And uh, so my husband and I were going to be coming to camp meeting and spending a week in camp meeting and then coming here to your church. And we were thinking, should we fly? Should we drive? And, uh, and we decided to drive from our home in Land Lakes, Florida, there on the Gulf Coast, not knowing that that was actually a very good decision. And uh, we got out to camp meeting, and I did my first workshop, and I did my second workshop. And all of a sudden, I started thinking, you know, I kind of have a scratchy throat, and I'm starting to feel a little achy. And that was in the middle of a very unique time on planet Earth. <laughs> and my husband said, Sandy, I think you better test and see what's going on here. And I tested, and sure enough, I had COVID. And there was a, a law in the state of Carolina that that had to be announced. So in the main meeting, they said, Sandra Duran has left the grounds <laughs> with COVID. So when I finally came back, after I think camp meeting was closed down for a few years, and I, I finally came back this year, Several people that I didn't know stopped me on the grounds. They said, oh, you're the one that left with COVID. So I guess I now have a reputation. <laughs> but I am delighted to be back. And, you know, you think about what we all went through, something that was worldwide. I never thought in my lifetime there would be something touching everyone. You know, our, Eric mentioned in Sabbath school that our son's wife is from Bolivia. And so we actually have been to Bolivia. In fact, they are from La Paz, Bolivia, way up on top of the mountain. And I guess everything just hit me, what's happening on our planet, when they got COVID. And I'm thinking, here we are in Tampa Bay, Florida, experiencing the same thing as somebody on top of a mountain in Bolivia. It was mind-boggling to me. And the whole concept that in a blink of an eye, something could happen that could affect the whole planet. Wow. How many of you think the coming of Jesus is right around the corner? I mean, it is right around the corner. You know, a number of years ago, I was asked to write a curriculum for children on the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, from kindergarten through high school. And my first thought was, I don't know if I'm the right person. I could not wrap my head around teaching kindergartners about the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <laughs> that just didn't seem like a match to me. And so I said, well, let me pray about it, because I'm never one to just say no to something. I said, let me pray about it. And so I prayed about it. I went to bed, and somewhere in the night, a little poem actually came into my head. And the next morning, I grabbed the first pencil I found, and I wrote it down. And I said, Lord, I think you're trying to tell me something here. So I did then take on that task, which I've been doing for five years. But I thought you might like to see uh, God's way of making my mission clear. Uh, so let, let me show you the, the little book that, that I wrote. And it's Three Angels in the Sky. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Ready? Let's begin the story. First angel, give God the glory. He's always fair and good and true. He'll do what's right for me and you. He made the earth 
and outer space, now go and tell in every place. Second angel, the city's going down. Watch out, be safe, get out of town. And we, we just teach the little children, if someone's doing something wrong, get out of there. That's all they have to know. That's enough for them to know. Third angel, be patient, trust Jesus in light and in dark. He'll always protect you like Noah in the ark. Three angels in the sky to show the love of God on high. And when their stories said and done, we'll all look up and see God's son. So that was God's way of making my mission clear. <laughs> and no kidding, I wrote that down that morning, word for word, and then later we got the artists and everything to illustrate it. So I said, well, God, I'll take on this mission. And it was really a faith journey for me. I didn't even write the grade levels in order, whatever, and God would always give it to me just in time so that when it was time for me to write, I knew what I was going to work on, and, there, and all of the grade levels take it from a very different approach. So as I've been doing this kind of work, not only writing, but working with people, working with teachers, working with students, having online weeks of prayer, it's been very interesting, and I've discovered some very interesting things. And quite often, when I work with children, I ask them before I start, how do you feel about the judgment? And I show them this slide, and I ask them to pick one. How do you feel about the judgment? Now, what slide do you think most children pick before I work with them? Any ideas? How do you feel about the judgment? Yeah, yeah, they pick, the, they pick those, and, and particularly the crying emoji, which I think is rather disconcerting. Well, then I began asking adults, and usually I work with people who are employed by, by our church, so usually I'm working with teachers, and I ask the teachers, how did you feel about the judgment as a child, and how do you feel now? And as a child, again, we get the crying one, and what percent of people that, and this is not anything official, don't, don't report this to the Andrews University archives. <laughs> you know, this is just a straw poll of people that I have asked. But when I've worked with teachers and homeschool parents and, and, and whatnot, and I ask them, as adults, now, how do you feel about the judgment? What percent do you think, again, select crying or angry or afraid or something like that. It's 50%, 50%. So I thought, wow, wow. Um, I think we need to, to look at that. So I thought I, I would tell you this morning, I started to think about it, and I actually have five reasons that I celebrate God for the judgment, that I think it's, it's a wonderful, exciting thing. And so my hope for you is that when we're finished this morning, you won't have a sense of fear about the judgment, but you'll have a sense of, of wonder. Um, and, and it is something that you'll feel a happy feeling about, actually. Um, but let's take a look at the first angel's message. Why don't you read it right out loud with me? You ready? He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So we're looking at that first part. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Now we know that fear God doesn't mean to be afraid of God, doesn't mean to be trembling in, in abject fear, but it means to give him respect give him honor, right? Um, but in our day now, when you see the phrase judgment day, and if you were to go to your web browser and put in judgment day, you get pictures of bloodshed and terror and war and revenge and the final end. But God is telling us to fear God and give him glory. Well, 
what does it mean to give God glory? It, what does it mean to give anyone glory, to celebrate? Uh, I mean, when you think of glory, you don't think of something that is, is fearful and terrible, like you wouldn't see on a screen all this bloodshed and war and horrible things in the word glory. So that right there is our first clue. I, I started to think, when, when you give somebody glory, you honor, you celebrate that person. I was thinking, well, who have we celebrated lately, just to try to relate it to us here in this earth? We're in the graduation season. I don't know if any of you have been to any graduations yet, but when you go to a graduation, you're celebrating that person. We just recently, probably a month ago, went to my niece's graduation who got her master's degree as a nurse educator. She is a pediatric oncology nurse. She could have done anything she wanted. And she rocks those little babies and those little children. And some of them, you know, she is the last one to treat them very tenderly. Um, when, when those little babies die, those little children, sometimes she works with children for years on and off. And now her job is to teach others to be as gracious and kind in that role as she is. We were celebrating her victory, that here she's a young mom with two little boys, and she's a nurse, and she got her master's degree. We were celebrating her. We were giving glory in a sense. So the first angel is telling us, give God glory for the judgment. So the first reason that we actually celebrate the judgment is because it's biblical. It's actually biblical to do it because the first angel tells us, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. Glory is a beautiful thing. When you give somebody glory, you're celebrating like these beautiful songs we had here this morning. I, I just, wow, when it was time for me to come up here, I was already feeling like I was in the presence of God, like I am in the presence of God because that beautiful music was giving God glory. All right, so that's reason number one that we give God glory. Now, reason number two that we celebrate the judgment is because it reminds us of the unconditional love of Jesus. You know, for some people, they are thinking of the judgment, they're in fear because they're picturing themselves before that judgment bar, but it is not a time to think of ourselves, it's a time to think of Jesus who gave his unconditional love for us. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? What better reason can we find to celebrate the judgment? And I put some texts in here as to why we celebrate the judgment. We celebrate the judgment because for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Wow. We celebrate the judgment because let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is what? Is faithful. Is that not a reason to celebrate? His grace is what? Sufficient for us. His grace is enough. If you leave here with nothing else, I would pray and hope that that will be ringing in your mind. His grace is enough. It's enough. We give God glory because when we sin, we have a what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We give God glory because he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. We give God glory because he declares, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. So the judgment is not something that we need to be fearing and having these sad and, and terrorized feelings about. What does Isaiah say? Will not remember your sins. Wow, 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 wow. All right, I'm going to, um, I'm going to read you something in a minute here, but I want to paint the picture. This comes out of the great controversy. And Ellen White paints a picture of Judgment Day. And she says that it's Judgment Day and shrouded with the clouds of heaven. What a beautiful, beautiful image. Shrouded with the clouds of heaven, surrounded by a cast of angels, 
the Son of Man makes his appearance. And he comes into that room. He approaches the Father. He opens the book. And judgment begins. And Christ begins his work. He starts with Adam. And he goes down every name. And he lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angel. And he claims forgiveness for people of faith down through the ages. Then in the midst of this glorious scene, another presence appears, the opposite of Christ, dark, foreboding, evil, the accuser of the brethren, maybe the one that accuses you and accuses me, and we hear that voice, you're not good enough. Look at all these things you've done. And let's look at what the great controversy has to say when this evil, foreboding presence enters the room. While Jesus is pleading for the subjects of his grace, Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. The great deceiver has sought to lead them into skepticism, to cause them to lose confidence in God, to separate themselves from his love, and to break his law. So he's the one in the first place that has led everybody in the wrong way. And now he points to the record of their lives, to the defects of character, the unlikeliness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer, to all the sins that he has tempted them to commit. And because of these, he claims them as his subjects. Wow. So, this, so Satan is there saying, look, Jesus, these are not your people. They're nothing like you. They're totally unlike you. They have committed all these sins. They are mine. And what happens next? What happens next? Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith and claiming for them forgiveness. He lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels saying, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. I will forgive their iniquity and will remember them no more. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Is that not beautiful? He does, Jesus doesn't get into a big dispute about the sins. He doesn't excuse the sins. He says, they're mine. I forgive their sins. What a reason to give God glory for the judgment. We are covered. His grace is enough. His grace is enough. That's reason enough now, right? We could all go home now and eat our veggie burgers or something. <laughs> but I have, a, I have more reasons, more reasons to celebrate for the judgment. Reason number three. Whoops, let's go back one. We celebrate the judgment. Reason number three, because our lawyer and our judge are one and the same. Could you imagine that? If you were accused of a crime and your lawyer and your judge were one and the same, wow, wow. You walk into the courtroom <laughs> trembling and it's the same person. So let's imagine for a moment that you really blew it. You know, you, you got this new Maserati and you decided this is the time to test the speed. So you took it out here three o'clock in the morning thinking nobody's going to be around and you blow past the Asheville exit going over a hundred miles an hour and all of a sudden though you see those lights pulling up behind you and you're like oh no <laughs> they've got me now <laughs> and you are arrested clocked in it over a hundred miles an hour so you engage the services of your friendly neighborhood lawyer and you're afraid, and you're, you're sitting there, and the lawyer is like, don't worry, I've got you, I'm gonna be right here by your side, it's gonna be okay, we're, we're gonna work this thing out, and you're like, yeah, I just don't have the money, and I, I don't know what's gonna happen to me, I, I don't have the time to go to jail. You walk into the courtroom, and sitting in the judge's seat is your lawyer. Wow, <laughs> wow. I mean, anything that you think of for your advocate and lawyer to be the same person. Or what if you're a student and you, you're, you're 
working on your paper and you're making all these errors and you know it's not that good and your English teacher says, not a problem. I'm going to correct all the grammar, get it all fixed up so I can give it an A. <laughs> wow, it just doesn't happen here. But this is the way that the things have been set up. And I, you know, I thought of something. In the conflict of the ages, oh wait, now I got to get this right. <laughs> there, there's bias. I mean, there, there's bias on our favor. Right? The whole thing, you know, we talk about you don't want bias, but what about if the bias is in your own favor? And that is how it is all, it's all set up in, in the plan of salvation. Um, so, so how do I know this? How do I know that our lawyer and our judge are the same person? Well, let's take a look. 1 John 2, 1, when we sin, we have what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What's an advocate? Yeah, your lawyer, the one that's, that's right there. So, so we know he's the advocate. Well, what about this? John 5, 26 through 27, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to do what? To judge because he's the Son of Man. So here we go. <laughs> First, we have the text that he's our advocate, and then he's our judge. Is that a reason to say praise the Lord for the judgment? You'll never see a situation like that again, and when it really counts, there you go. All right, reason number four, we celebrate the judgment because the God of justice is going to put an end to injustice. Injustice. Is there anyone here that's ever experienced injustice? Yeah, it's not a good thing, is it? I've experienced it. I've experienced, in my life, I've experienced gender bias in a job. And it's not a good thing. It's injustice when you're not treated fairly. I'm sure there are those of you, and if you have never experienced injustice, let me tell you, it is a current reality for many, many people. Um, maybe there are those who have been treated unfairly because they look differently than others expected them to look, you know? Maybe you're applying for a job on the phone and then you show up, oh, I didn't think that was what you're gonna look like. <laughs> Maybe somebody doesn't say it, but something is a little off. Maybe somebody thinks you're too old. You know, it's interesting when you see bias against the elderly. I remember one time when my father as an elderly man, we went grocery shopping. He went to put his card or something in to pay for the groceries, and it wasn't, something wasn't working. And there was the smirk and the sneer that he was too old to figure it out until the next person went to do it, and then it was like, oh, I guess our machine isn't working. <laughs> you know, there are times when you are not treated fairly because people have a preconceived idea of who they think you are. Maybe some people think that you're from the wrong part of the country, from the wrong side of the tracks. Injustice is a terrible thing. I'm gonna tell you a story about a boy by the name of John Bunn. When I was writing the curriculum, I thought, I want things that kids can relate to. And so I did some research, and I thought, I wanna find somebody that experienced injustice so these seventh and eighth graders can understand why we look forward to a God who is fair. And when you talk to kids who have done our curriculum in seventh and eighth grade, they always come back to John Bunn. This is the one thing they remember. Um, here's a picture of John Bunn when he was 14 years old. It was August 14, 1991 in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. John Bunn was sitting at his mother's table. They were chatting there around the table, and he, it was summertime. He was getting ready maybe to go out and shoot a few baskets, play some basketball, when a loud bang sounds on the door, and the police burst in, and they demanded that John Bunn come with them. So they brought him to Brooklyn's 77th Precinct. They handcuffed him, and they sent in a detective by the name of Louis Scarcella. 
And I later researched more about Louis Scarcella, and this thing with John Bunn was not a one-time thing. There were other things. He, he himself later um, faced, I believe, some jail time or something for some of the things they later found out that he had done. But anyway, so he handcuffs John Bunn, 14-year-old kid, to a pole. And here are John Bunn's own words. He said he was threatening me, telling me that I was never coming home if I wouldn't tell him what he wanted to know. He also told me that they already had my co-defendant, that they had slammed his head into a wall and they already had him. His co-defendant, a boy that John Bunn barely knew. And soon he found out they were both suspected of the same crime, killing a Rikers Island police officer, an off-duty police officer. And John Bunn said, I kept telling them, no, I have no idea. I don't know what you're talking about. But Detective Scarcella said, I don't believe you. So they had a lineup. And because John Bunn was a 14-year-old boy, he was shorter than the other people. He was only five foot two, so they had to improvise. And they put chairs out so that they would all sit in chairs and they would all hold up a number. And after this, Scarcella came out and said to John Bunn, it's your lucky day. Your number was chosen. A little bit about the trial. It lasted for one day. There was one witness. The blood and the fingerprints did not match John Bunn. But that didn't seem to matter. So because of this, this young boy was in jail, prison, for 25 years years. Do you, would you like to see him on the day he finally got out? Oh, and that should be actually a video, but I guess I don't have the video in there. But the video would make you cry because he talks about, I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent man. And it took him all that time all that time. If you want to do something chilling, you can actually look up the website of all the exonerations. What happened was they finally came up with the DNA testing. I believe in um, the not, maybe, I'm not exactly sure the date, but I think I actually have it here on the slide. Yeah, 1989 DNA testing came into play, but John Bunn when he found out about the DNA testing, he made a request that he could you know, have his DNA tested, but it was not, the state where he was in prison had not yet accepted that as evidence. I believe he was actually in Alabama or something was where they sent him to prison. But since 1989, when DNA testing has come into play, there have been 2,858 exonerations. 25,600 years have been lost lost. So that means 2,858 people that we know of were shown to have not committed the crime for being in prison. I tell you, in my mind, that is one of the most chilling things to think about to have your freedom taken away from you. It's a horrible thought, a horrible thought. I have a very high freedom need. <laughs> I can't even handle it I've been offered some, some very high-level jobs, but when I've looked to see that there is no window in the office, I say, I cannot take this job. <laughs> you know, I have a very high freedom need. I need to see outside. I need to be outside. The thought of being incarcerated for something that you did not do, and a young boy like that. So, wow, wow. We celebrate Judgment Day, because the only fair and wise and true God is going to make everything right. Amen? All right. Next reason to celebrate Judgment Day. Because it is the kickoff of a life that will be infinitely better than the one we have here. <laughs> right? Wow, you think about it. You think about what's coming with all this. You know, you think about those you've lost. I think about my mom and my dad, you know, and the treasure you have, the buried treasure you have in the ground right now, you know? Seeing these people you love again, seeing the face of Jesus for the first time. And what about all this stuff we deal with here, you know? 
we got a lot of hurricanes down where we are, and we're entering the hurricane season now. We don't know what we're in for. The first year we moved to Florida, we had three hurricanes in a row. Francis, Charlie, and Jean. <laughs> and it was a challenging time. And you think of earthquakes and floods and all of the things on this planet and people angry at other people who think differently. Are you ready to stop worrying about the threat of war? Are you ready to stop worrying about that and nuclear explosions and all of these horrible things on our planet? Do you want to go home? That's the fifth reason that we celebrate Judgment Day because it ushers in the second coming of Christ, you know, that beautiful day when he'll put that silver trumpet to his lips and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's a beautiful time that's ahead of us. So if you've had fear over the judgment, it is time to let it go. It is time to let it go. First of all, it's biblical to celebrate the judgment because the first angel says, give God glory for the judgment hour is here. Give God glory. That doesn't sound like doom and gloom to me. That sounds like a party. The second reason, it's a reminder of Jesus' unconditional love for us. Remember, he lifts his wounded hands to the Father and says, they're mine. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. They're mine. The third reason, it's biased. <laughs> the whole thing is biased in our favor. Our judge and lawyer are one and the same. So the whole thing, there's a conflict of the interest, there's a conflict of interest in the conflict of the ages. <laughs> there's a conflict of interest. It's in our favor. It's designed for our case to win. Number four, it's the ultimate justice. All of the horrible injustice on this earth will be gone. And number five, it's the beginning of a new life in Jesus. May God bless you as you draw closer to Jesus and accept his ultimate sacrifice for you.